praise the Lord. We want to bless the name of the Lord for another opportunity to celebrate Christmas in the land of the living. I'll turn with me briefly in your Bible to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. We read it even at the beginning of the service, but I would like to refer to it again. Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Verse 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. The virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to his son and he gave him the name Jesus. Let us pray together. We give praise to you, our Father, for the privilege that we have to come together again to celebrate the birth of your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We appreciate you, Father, because we gave him to us to be our savior from sin. Father, we pray that today you help us to grow in our appreciation of all the wonders you perform and the miracles you accomplish through him to the end, O oh God, that we could be who we are today, children of the living God, in the name of Jesus. We pray, Father, that as we look into your word, it will please you to reveal more of your will to us through the help of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Take the words of my mouth, O God, and the thoughts of all of our hearts. Use them for your glory this moment, for we pray in Jesus' name. Rejoicing in the birth of the Savior for sinners. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, to convince him to take Mary as his wife, he said, What is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Again, when the same angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds to announce the birth of Jesus, he said, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. It is very clear from these two passages that Jesus was born to be a savior for sinners. This fact is the good news of great joy that will be for all the people. But how much of the joy that people express at Christmas comes out of the knowledge that people have that a savior has truly been born to save them from sins. It is to the extent to which we appreciate what sin is and what sin does that we can truly rejoice in the birth of Jesus Christ and this is what we want to explore this morning the word sin is so commonly used that it has become debased distorted and abused in this condition it carries very little emotional or intellectual force I believe people prefer the word crime, the word crime strikes a bigger and stronger note upon our ears and minds than the word sin. The word crime has a greater effect on us because it is more visible and often has a more immediate impact. If we have been told that Jesus or the, person, the baby born on Christmas Day will deliver us from crime or from criminals, I'm sure many people will pay more attention. But deliver us from sin, very people pay little attention even nowadays. Because of the way we throw the word around, it has very little impact upon the lives of people today. Crime forces us to seek security so that it doesn't touch us in a painful way. That is why we install all kinds of gadgets in our homes and our offices to pre 
protect us against criminals and from crime that people would like to perpetrate or perpetrate even against us. Crime makes us feel apprehensive and suspicious and many people take steps to warn others of the danger. Though the overwhelming majority of crimes are also sins, not all crimes are sins because crimes have to do with the breaking of the law of the land. But sometimes the laws may not be things that if we break, constitutes sin even before God. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Later he adds, Therefore just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. One thing about sin is that sin is universal. And perhaps this is one reason why the term is so frequently ignored. So many are sinning so frequently that has become a way of life. It has become acceptable because everybody is doing it. Sin is not like a disease such as Ebola that some contract and others escape. Some may self-righteously think they are better than others because of outward appearance, living by sight, that is, but we have all been soiled by sin. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. The second thing about sin that we need to note is that sin enslaves. That is, it holds man under its authority. Just as a child is under his parents or an army is under its commander, so sin enslaves every one of us. Every human being that comes into the world is a slave, comes as a slave to sin. Sin is a living, active, forceful, and dynamic power that has man under its way all the time before we are delivered from it by God through the mercy of, he, of God that was shown to us in Jesus Christ. Everyone, the humorer, the ethical, the religious, the self-righteous, the atheist, the agnostic, the king, the commoner, the businessman, the housewife, the young and the old, are caught within scripture's web of confinement due to sin. Man is under the power of sin. He lives in subjection to it and is totally controlled even by sin and sin runs the affairs of many lives in the world today. Even after a person becomes converted, sin still struggles mightily to retain its former dominion over the individual. So basic and pervasive is sin's grip. Every five live. That is deviation from a way that has been set for us to walk in by God. Deviation from the path that God has established for our conduct here on earth. Deviation from the law that God has given for instruction and to direct the course of our lives. Sin is failure to live up to a standard. Not the standard set by men, but the standard set by God. And so these two words, trespasses and sins, are found joined together by Paul in Ephesians 2 verse 1 when he said, And you he has made alive who are dead in trespasses and sins. Trespasses mean to go off a path, to fall or to slip. When the word trespass is applied to moral and ethical issues, it means deviation from the right way, to wander away along the path that we have chosen for ourselves. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Wandering away, that's trespass. Sin, on the other hand, is generally associated with missing the mark, failing to eat the target. And that target is what is set by God every human being to eat by the way we live and by the things that we do from time to time. In moral or ethical context, it means to fail in fulfilling our purpose, to go wrong or to fail to live according to an accepted standard or ideal. Sin is a failure to be what we ought to be and could be. We sin when we fail to live up to the standard that God has established for us that we can read about in this Bible, 
that we can see demonstrated by the lives of biblical characters that we celebrate today. As such, sin reaches into marital relationships, the bringing up of children, when we fail to conduct ourselves within our marriages in the way that God prescribes in his word. We are sinning. When we fail to bring up our children according to the will of God, we are sinning. Failure to be clean in thoughts, clean also by the way we live, is sinning. The way we dress when we fall short of God's expectation, by the way we dress, we are sinning. When we fail also to show love even to strangers, to be hospitable, we are sinning. Also in the ways of, by which we use our body, we will be sinning. Even how we drive our vehicles can constitute sin because we have failed to hit the mark set by God concerning the use of such things, even that he has given us. Sin involves itself in the entire range of human attitudes, such as pride, envy, anger, hatred, greed, jealousy, resentment, depression, bitterness. In the, in the New Testament, the biblical writers always use the word sin in a moral and ethical sense, whether describing sin of commission or omission, sin in thought, sin in feeling, sin in word, or sin in deed. And the standard we so frequently fall short of is God's standard. In Ephesians 4, 4, 13, Paul said, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In Christ, we see the embodiment of the kind of person that every one of us, every human being is expected to be like. If you never knew before, if you never considered that there's a standard to which God holds our lives, we see that standard in Jesus. He is the perfect man. He came to live a perfect life, to demonstrate to us the kind of life that God expects of every human being that he makes to dwell on the surface of this earth. First, about the measure of the stature or the fullness of Christ. That is God's expectation of us. You know, many times we tend to think we are doing very well. Because when we look around us, we see all kinds of people who are not pulling their weight at all in terms of living in obedience to God, in terms of conducting themselves in accordance with the will of God. I'm sure there's nobody who compares himself to a person like Hitler that doesn't feel good about himself. Or you compare yourself to a person like Abacha. Or you compare yourself to a person like maybe Oyenusi, all those notorious armed robbers who have passed this way. Or Anini. When you compare yourself to all those people, you feel good about yourself. But when we compare ourselves to Jesus, I'm sure what comes to our mind is that we are not hitting the target at all. We are not pulling our weight at all. We are in fact sinning because we fail even to live up to that target. So what does sin do, do even to us? Paul in Ephesians 2, 2, 3 says, in which you once walked according to the curse of this world, right to the Ephesian Christians, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now walks in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. In this past, in these verses, he links together many things about sin. He says, all have been involved in sin. No one can point accusing finger at another because some of the fingers also are pointing back at you. Every one of us. Wherever you are born, into whichever family you are born, whatever may be the religious practices, even of the family into which you are born, whether you are red, black, yellow, pink, whatever may be the shade of your skin, the color of your skin, matters not. Whether you are educated or illiterate, rich or poor, everybody is roped into this state of sin. Not only that, sin is the force that drives this world. And we see manifestation of it everywhere. 
I don't know how you feel about but sometimes it can be burdensome. It can be threatening. It can instill fear into us when we see people demonstrate sin. It is the force that drives this world. It is what is responsible for all the evil activities that we hear about, that we read about. It is what is responsible for people picking up the gun and killing men. It is what is responsible for people beheading other human beings like themselves. It is what is responsible for somebody stealing the whole money left that is expected to be used to benefit the lot of us in our nation and other places. It is the force that drives this world. It is the reason for all the pain, the sorrow, the grief, the death, both untimely, and even the death that comes after somebody has lived a full and long life. This driving force emanates from Satan. Satan presides over it, instigates it, he promotes it, he uses it to mess up life in societies all over the world. Sin also motivates conduct involving flesh and mind. The reason why we think the way we think, we behave the way we behave, is because of sin. Sin does negative things to us and to others. In fact, our lives are not the way they're supposed to be because of sin. If there was anything positive about sin or even anything neutral about it, our God, who is so loving, wouldn't have been concerned about it. He would not have led us to repentance or demanded that we repent of it. He would not have commanded us to overcome it and come out of this world of sin. Satan is the chief promoter and instigator of sin. His name means adversary. He's against God and anything godly. In Revelation chapter 9 verse 11, is called Abaddon and Apollyon. And both of these names, one Hebrew, the other Greek, mean destroyer. Satan is a destroyer. And the spirit that emanates from him that drives this world and produces sin is a destroying spirit. We can broadly say that sin does two bad things simultaneously. It produces negative results and it also destroys. William Barclay, author of the Daily Bible Study series, provides a list of things that sin destroys. One, he says sin destroys innocence. We find evidence of this truth at the very beginning of God's word. Very early in the Bible, in Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. We see that immediately Adam and Eve sinned against God. They felt shame because of their nakedness. And they doubly showed their guilt by hiding from God. One thing we know is that a truly innocent person has no need to hide. A truly innocent person never feels any form of shame. Secondly, sin leaves a tarnish on a person's mind so that it does not look at life in quite the same way anymore. It defiles. It scars. It corrupts our mind. It tarnishes a person's mind. In the days of his flesh, our Lord Jesus said that unless we become like little children, we will not be in the kingdom of heaven. By that, he was referring to the beauty of the innocence of little children and the harmless vulnerability of little children. They produce no harm, no shame, no guilt. But what happens when these children become adults, as they grow up to become adults? They become sophisticated, worldly, cosmopolitan, cynical, suspicious, sarcastic, prejudiced, self-centered, cool, uninvolved, and many other negative things. They also seem to lose their zest for life. That's what sin does. That's when, when we see children growing up, they look so innocent, so mean. They're not ashamed. They're not afraid. But as they become teenagers, they become youth, they become young adults, and they progress into life like that, it's a different ball game. Sin tarnishes their minds. They stop looking at life the way they earlier on, when they were growing up, when they were little children, looked at it. Sin also destroys ideals. A tragic process begins when we become involved in sin. At first, we regard sin with horror. 
if we continue to commit this sin, we, st we will still feel ill at ease about it. Sometimes we feel unhappy about it. But gradually, our consciences will begin to adjust. Each sin makes the next one a bit easier. Over time, our conduct will become ent entirely acceptable. And we will sin without a qualm, without even thinking about it, without being bothered about it any longer. Sin is addictive like a drug. As the addiction becomes stronger, the ideal depreciates until it is completely gone. Sin also destroys the will. Our wills are the power or faculty by which our mind makes choices and acts to carry them out. An old adage says, sow an act and reap a habit. Sow a habit and reap a character. Sow a character and reap a destiny. At first, against our will, we engage in some forbidden pleasure, either out of weakness or curiosity or even sheer carnality. But if the practice continues, these sins we see, we see because we cannot help doing so. We become addicted to it. Once a sin becomes a habit, we consider it to become almost a necessity. When it becomes a necessity, of course, our destiny is already revealed to us. How we are going to end. Not only that, sin is deceitful. By which we mean it is seductively and enticingly misleading. That's what sin is. It's deceitful. It promises us pleasure, contentment, and fulfillment. It promises us a wonderful life. But what it delivers on these things is fleeting and ultimately unsatisfying. Its deceitfulness is the very reason why it has addictive qualities. We are lured to try to capture what it can never deliver on. And that pleasure is never quite enough to produce the contentment and fulfillment we desire. Thus, we are forced into greater and deeper perversions until it results in death. That's why you find all over the world people are working hard to produce and promote more and more quote-unquote interesting and exciting activities. Why? Because they are being lured into the grip and grab even of the devil that will ultimately lead them to death. Sin produces slavery. This product follows directly from the destruction of the will. When we are no longer free to make our choices and do the things that we know are right for us to do, then we are slaves. When a person sins, he's not really doing what he likes, but what sin likes. There is nobody in this world who does what he likes. We only do what sin likes. We are slaves under sin. That was the station into which Jesus was born. The life of people in the world into which he was born. He was born into a land, into a community of people, into a world of slaves. Slaves to sin. Even though somebody may enjoy the sin while he's doing it, that person is not in control. Sin is. And this is doubly true when one sins with knowledge. Not only that, sin produces more sin. It's very fatal. Very productive. In James chapter 1, verses 12 to 16, we find James listing the steps leading to sin, beginning with temptation. People really stop at just one sin. And it is often not long before they add another one and another one to the chain of sin. And that's why we find in the Bible, God symbolizes sin, or using leaven, to symbolize sin as leaven spreads through the dough so does sin walk even through our lives and corrupts everything about us sin produces sickness pain and degeneracy when we look at Mark 2 verses 1 to 10 that encounter of Jesus with the paralytic man we see that Jesus connected sin and sickness and of course, this effect is often subtle because an illness or a poor, weak, run-down state of health may not be the result of any specific sin. It may be the product of a series of sins committed over many years or a lifetime. 
Sin is so subtle that a worldly person examining himself for the cause of his sickness may never consider it at all. Because they don't know God, they will have no inclination to look for sin as a cause of their illness or disease or pain. But Jesus connected it too. He said to the man, he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. Afterward, he found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well, see no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Sin produces death. Death is the ultimate in slavery. A bondage so intense, no one escapes from it unless the Lord raises him or her. It is such a powerful enemy that according to 1 Corinthians 15, 26, it is the last enemy to be destroyed. So sin is a formidable and devastating opponent. It locks within us, looking for any opportunity to spring forth and gain dominion over us, seeking to produce more of its kind while it destroys the life God intended for us. And finally, it destroys life itself. So we see that when the angels announced the birth of Jesus and said he will save his people from their sins, when they announced that to Joseph, and when also on the night on which he was born, the angel of the Lord announced to the shepherd and said, today a savior has been born to you. The only response that they could give, I mean the other angels could give to that astounding news was to sing God's praise to truly rejoice and I believe by so doing they were inviting other the human beings who will be the direct beneficiary of what he will achieve when he comes into the world to rejoice unfortunately we find that joy at Christmas is very superficial because it's not deep rooted, deeply rooted in the tree rich understanding of the purpose for which he came, of what he actually came to deliver us from. He came to deliver us from sin. From what we have considered about what sin is and what sin does, I believe that if we throw all caution to the wind and dance and sing and express our joy, even on a day like this, we are just doing what is fitting and what is required. What gives understand, I mean, what makes, what reveals that we truly appreciate why he came. Because sin cut us out of all the benefits and blessings that God wants us to have as his people. Sin brings us under the bondage to the enemy. See it? And sin frustrates life and makes life extremely hard even for us to live here on earth. Everything that we consider to be the problem of the world today is a symptom of sin. It's not the real problem. It's not the real issue. Whether it's people committing mass murder all over the place, or people carrying out acts of terrorism all over the place, or people stealing, people fornicating, people breaking vows, people do all manners of evil that we can ever claim or consider to be the bane of our existence today. The problem of our world today, they are mere symptoms of the real, real problem. And that problem is sin. The degree of our appreciation of God's goodness in giving us his son to be our savior from sin stands in direct proportion to our understanding and abhorrence of sin. Also, the degree of our joy at his birth stands in direct proportion to our understanding of the devastating effects of sin upon our lives. The only way we can truly rejoice at Christmas, the only way we can truly rejoice when the story of his birth is told to us is when we truly understand the devastating effect of sin upon our lives. It's only somebody who is truly born again who knew what he was before he gave his life to Christ? Who knew the kind of life that he, he knew he could, he should live, but he couldn't live in his own, in his own, by his own efforts? 
who knew the right but he couldn't do it and knew the wrong but he couldn't resist doing it that can truly rejoice for such a person whether he's able to buy a new dress at Christmas or he's able to eat the best food that people clamor for even at such a time as this or he's able to have a very very kind of lavish entertainment even given to him by people he will truly rejoice why? because nothing can compare even to the deliverance that God wrought for us from the power of sin through the coming of Jesus Christ to die for our sins on the cross of Calvary. Nothing can compare to that. Nothing can, compare, nothing can bring greater joy. Nothing can give us greater ex cause for excitement here on earth than the knowledge of the great deliverance that was wrought for us from the power of sin and Satan who uses it to steal, to kill, and destroy in the world today. If you are here today, do you truly know what Jesus did for you? Why he came to the world? If you truly know, then you will want to be like those angels to sing his praise, to rejoice, to announce that God has, is, is good. But if you are here today, you still wonder what's the whole force about maybe you need to check again your life to see whether you are truly acquainting yourself with the true purpose even of his coming, namely to deliver you from sin. And also you need to check to see whether you are not overlooking sin as a fundamental problem to you, but you are considering other things, other issues about your life today to be of greater significance to occupy your attention and probably what you want him to deliver you from than sin. For sin stands at the root of every problem you may identify as your problem today and God is calling you to see your problem for what truly it really is sin sin is your problem and Jesus was born in order to be your savior from sin sin enslaves that's why no human being can save himself sin destroys that's why we cannot enjoy the best that God wants us to have here on earth in our state of sin with sin running our lives with sin standing as a barrier between us and God with sin shutting the ears of God to our cries and limiting the hands of God so that it will not touch us and affect our lives as powerfully as he wants them to affect our lives here on earth so God is calling us who are saved even to appreciate what a terrible fate or what a terrible situation Jesus came to deliver us from. Let us think about it. Let us reflect upon it. And let us rejoice in that deliverance that he wrought for us. And let us also make up our minds that on account of our appreciation of the devastating effect of sin upon our lives, we will not trifle with it. We will not treat it with levity. We will not indulge in it. In fact, we will flee from its appearance. We will not allow it even to continue to rob us of the benefits and the blessings that God wants us to have through his son, Jesus Christ. If you are not saved, let today be your day of salvation. That will be a bigger compensation, a bigger gift to you. If you receive salvation as a gift from God today, than if you are given even a lot of material things, a lot of physical things, that will perish with their use, but will not allow you even to experience even the fullness of life that God wants you to have. So God is calling us even to rejoice in the birth of the Savior for sinners. Let us pray together. I want each one of us to bless the name of the Lord again because in Jesus, God provided for us a Savior from our sins. I want you to appreciate God. If you truly are saved, what were you saved from? What was the lifestyle that you indulged in? What was the work that sin was accomplishing in your lives that would have totally destroyed you even before now, if not that you gave your life to Christ? Let the memory of what God delivered you from, that sin was so, that was a besetting one to you, that become a, became a habit of your life, that would have ultimately destroyed before this time that God delivered you from. If you are born again, give God the glory because of the life that salvation that Jesus brings 
makes possible for you. Let that be the reason for your celebration today, your rejoicing today. Talk to God. Appreciate Him again. Because the greatest enemy that you are, sin, God dealt with it for you through the coming of Jesus into the world. If He had not come, life in the world for us would have been worse than what it is. It's bad enough, terrible as it is, would have been much worse. If you are here today, you are not born again, let today be your day of salvation. Whatever else you may consider to be your problem, know that you are the greater one that God saw and God dealt with through the coming of his son Jesus into the world. Why don't you today repent from your sin? Do not allow iniquity, sin to be your ruin. Do not allow the hand of the enemy employed in grounding you by reason of your sin to continue to have effect upon your life. Let Jesus set you free from sin. Let him set you free from every bondage of the enemy. I want us to pray also that this knowledge of the purpose for which Jesus came will be spread all over the world. The north, the south, the east and west of our location. All the continents of the world, all the nations of the world. Today the eyes of people have been blinded, the minds of people have been blinded even to the true problem that we have, namely sin. We are solving the symptoms of sin. Sign that it is current in the human affairs today are the things that we are dealing with. Pray that every place in the world today, they will understand sin for what it is. They will understand even the destructive powers of it. And they will come to Jesus, the Savior, in order to be saved from sin. No one can be saved from sin except through Jesus. Except by him, by what he accomplished on the cross of Calvary. Let's pray that this understanding that is largely lost upon men, that is not current in human understanding today of life, that it will grip every heart. It will grip every mind. It will direct even the course even of life of people in every society in the world. So that joy at Christmas will be a true joy, not a manufactured joy, not joy on account of circumstances of life, but joy on account of what God truly did that solved the problem of sin once and for all. Let's appreciate God for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Sovereign Lord, we glorify your holy name for grace given to us to come together again to celebrate the gift of our Savior from sin our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to thank you, Father, because sin was such a destructive power over the lives of men. Father, sin was such a problem which no one had any solution to. Father, we thank you because you stepped into the situation and did for us what no one else could have done for us, what we we'll never in a trillion years have done for ourselves. Father, we give you the glory for this in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, for as many of us who are here today who are born again, who are saved by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary from sin. Father, we thank you for all that you delivered us from. We thank you for all that you are delivering us from moment by moment. And we thank you, oh God, for the great future that we have ahead of us with you in heaven, when ultimately we shall be delivered from the presence of sin. Father, we give you glory for this in Jesus' name. Father, may the understanding of what you have done for us continue to make us, O oh God, to rejoice, not only at Christmas, but every day of our lives in the name of Jesus. But particularly today, O oh God, bring it, O oh God, forcefully to our minds what you have accomplished for us, O oh God, namely deliverance from sin through the coming of Jesus into the world. So that, Father, as we eat, as we drink, Father, our joy will be richer because it will be strengthened by the understanding of the spiritual benefits of his coming in the name of Jesus. Our Father, we thank you because we know that you will help us to flee from every appearance of sin. Help us, O oh God, not to succumb to the temptation to sin. Father, not to be roped in, O oh God, and taken advantage of again by the deceitfulness of sin in the name of Jesus. Our Father, we pray for those who are here without a relationship to you that today, O oh Lord, will be their day of salvation. 
as many as prayed even to receive Christ. We pray, Father, that that deliverance that Jesus came to bring, that salvation that he came to give, will be their portion in Jesus' name. Our Father, we pray that all over the world, this understanding of the devastating nature of sin and the destructive powers of it, O oh God, will come to be the possession of every human being in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that you will cause your people to noises abroad all over the world. So that, Father, in societies all over the world, we are the devastating effects and destructive parts of sin. Father, is, are being witnessed every day, being experienced every day, with a great deal of lamentation following, that, Lord, they will come to the end of such slavery under the yoke of sin in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that Jesus who is, whom you have given to us to be our savior from sin, Father, will indeed be savior of all mankind, even today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. Be glorified, God, because we know you surpass expectations. But we have prayed in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord.